with respect to learning styles and basically the PDDs, right? Pervasive Development Orders, or if you want to narrow it down, ADHD. So, in order to start this, what I'm thinking is, let's take a look at kind of what is thinking? What is, what is the mind? But not in terms of like structure, because most everyone agrees that the structure of the brain is basically the same with a PDD person as opposed to a normal person. Nobody's, as far as I know, nobody's ever been able to find any real differences. But it's in again in the usage in the in in wh how the brain is functioning that that's the difference. So so is there um, some trait with high visuals or um, folks with ADHD or or some uh, some of the pervasive developmental disorders that makes them susceptible to addiction? more than other folks. Does that make sense? Um, they do know, um, just basic research shows that folks with ADD are about 300% more likely to get involved with drugs and alcohol and to have trouble with the law by like, I mean like by the time they're like 21 or something. So if they carried that through lifetime, I don't even know what they would come up with. Um, and if they expanded their definition of folks that are subclinical ADD but have the high visual learning style, I don't, I don't know. I mean, is it possible that it could be almost everyone that suffers from addiction is more of that right brain learning style? Any thoughts? Any ideas? She was okay. So, <clears throat> is it possible, or um, is it is is there a case to be made for um, the source of addiction? being something that has to do with what we call this broad scale of pervasive development disorders, um, possibly ADD, possibly ODD. Um, there's already research that shows that people diagnosed with ADD are like 300% more likely to get involved with drugs and addiction and, and, and alcohol. So if you expanded that definition, not only to be just ADD or ADHD, but all pervasive developmental disorders, and also subclinical. So the guys that are, you know, up here, left brain, right brain, you know, here's the, uh, you know, the curve with the standard deviation. So what if we were talking about this whole group here, kind of of high visuals, could there be, if, you, if we look very closely 
at the learning profiles of most people with, with addiction problems, would we find that a lot of their learning styles are fairly similar? That they tend to be right brain, that they tend to be very creative, outside the box thinkers, um, they struggle with managing their own thoughts, controlling their own thoughts. And, and what if that might be at least part of the source of addiction? So, could it be that all the rehabilitation programs, just like most of the remedial reading programs and tutoring programs and all the special ed programs, if their approach to addiction is to try and treat this group of people as if they were normal, are they missing some a critical, critical piece of the pie? If the presumption is that when we get rid of your childhood trauma and your um, the physical addiction and the habit, right? Because we know those all deal. We we yeah. we they deal with uh, the trauma, the you know the emotional upset, anger, and all that, all the stuff that people are carrying around. We know they deal with the the physical addiction, getting them past that in all the rehabs. We know that they work really hard to get rid of the habits and the environment by, you know, moving them around. So the question is, if they, if they seem to be taking care of all the, the obvious culprits or sources of addiction, why is it that something like 90% of all people relapse, like within the first year? <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? So. What if, what if the source of addiction, because there's a lot of people that have trauma that don't go near drugs. A lot of people. A lot of people. In fact, I would say most of the people that have trauma don't go anywhere near drugs or alcohol or, or addiction. Um, um, these are pretty easy to take care of once you spend about, you know, um, um, oh, and there's the psychological addiction. Um, so, let's leave this one alone for a second. But, yeah, so if, we, if we're dealing with, the, with most of the, 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 the culprits, the, what seem to be the culprits, if you read the conventional literature, why is it that we have this, like, incredible relapse rate? Could it be that there's a source, there's, a, there's an underlying element to the addiction that's not being addressed? What if it is that like the kids with, we see the kids with ADD in school that start, begin self-medicating, some, some at an early age. Um, what if that is what the driving force is? It's this lack of ability to control their thinking. It's being victimized by their own thought process. It's having freight train brain when you try to go to sleep at night and you can't wind down, you can't turn it off. There's this constant, constant, never-ending chatter going off in your head. Hmm. Sounds to me it might drive anybody to drink. <laughs> so if that were the case, now that we're getting near the end of our program, we've gone through most of these, these techniques and, 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 and concepts at least two or three times, some of them. What, what might you guys bring to someone who comes to you and says, I have addiction? And let's just say for the moment 
for the moment that you they filled out a learning style profile and just for just for the sake of argument let's say that their profile shows they're intelligent they're very right brain in their thinking they're creative maybe they struggled with school and reading and, and some of those aspects of learning um, to some degree they're they're maybe they're very independent they're in your they're independent business people or or they um, they they like ski, skiing and snowboarding saying you know just the, the typical profile and they, but they've decided they don't want to drink anymore so what what would you, what do you think what would you bring to the party or what would you maybe recommend as a possible treatment for them So what would that do? Would that provide them a way to get a little quieter, quiet some of that noise? To learn how to relax without stress. Mm hmm Yeah. All right, we're done. <laughs> good answer, good answer. Um, you know, I, the people I've met, I've, I'm not active in that community. I haven't been for some time, but, but I was in my early 20s, the, you know, the product of a misspent youth. So, you know, I spent a, a number of years active to varying degrees in, in, uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, um, and uh, I even dabbled in some other ones. I went to Smokers Anonymous and, and I think Gamblers Anonymous. Not that I ever really had a problem with gambling, but it was interesting to me. Um, and and something I noticed was that most of the people seemed to have pretty a lot. Of, they had a lot in common, you know. A lot of them, at least back east, smoked like chimneys. No matter what meeting you went to, we were always sucking down piles of coffee. I mean, like we couldn't. There was, you know, a lot of us couldn't put together a sentence without a couple of cups of coffee in the room, all right? Um, and um, let's see, what else? I'm trying to think of some of the other things we had in common. Um, a lot of negative thoughts and away from What I'm saying with the addiction is focusing on what you don't want instead of what you do want, but most people who have addictions want to get away from that lifestyle, but they don't have a good picture of what they want right. to go to. Very good, yeah. So after they get further away oh, from no. that, then they go back because they still don't have a good thing to pull them forward. Mm -hmm. so they don't have, most people with addictions don't have any goals. They're just trying to get through the day. Right. Mm hmm. Right, right. So what might we do for them? How, what, what would be a strategy for that? Hmm? The time well... You gotta figure out what they want in life. Yeah, typical. Yeah, goal setting. We, we really work on connecting them with goals, their values. What, what, what are their values? What do they, what do they deem important? Um, so we can we can absolutely work with values and goal setting. And as somebody mentioned already, um, focus and attention. You know, we used to have a saying, you know, in, 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 I think I mentioned in AA, you know, when a normal person gets a flat tire, they call AAA. When an alcoholic gets a flat tire, they call suicide prevention. <laughs> so do you think, um, I don't know if you know many, many people with addiction, but have you ever noticed that some of them seem a little strung out, a little on edge? So I would, I would put at the top of the list... Stress reduction. And I 
do I do believe that the twelve steps where they're basically getting rid of what? Um, well, they they look at their own anger, right? They look at the 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 people who have hurt them, and they look at their anger, um, and and they really encourage you to to look at that and take responsibility for that. So, could it be that something similar to the like the fourth step might be the timeline, right? I'm just going to put time techniques um, to get rid of the negative emotions, anger, um, fear, guilt. Sadness, regrets. So we want to clear out the past, right? Get rid of all that, disconnect it so we can kind of stand in the present clean. Clean. Just be with what is. Not be responding to something that isn't even happening anymore. Well, it's harder when you have this bright green brain and you have trauma because you keep going over the old stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why this is huge in the recovery community. The you know, working on that trauma, because it's so, it's amplified. Yeah, in it's, your face and you hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and you would think that for the time and the effort that most, most uh, uh, centers, programs, work on that, you'd think that, that it would be the end of it. That that would be, you know, if you get rid of 90% of the trauma, you get rid of 90% of the addiction. But you get rid of 90% of the trauma, and you still have 90% of the addiction. <laughs> uh, I think the ADD makes the trauma worse for the person. I agree. Because you get focused on things. I agree. I agree. And one of these days, when I have time and money, I'll I, I think I'd like to maybe hook up with someone and start doing some research into this to confirm it. But um, in, in the absence of that, I think by if you were going to work with addiction, to have them do the learning style profile and compare it to your classic, you know, ADD profile or the classic sensory integration or... Uh, or uh, or OCD or ODD or autistic profile, and you, you know you see all those boxes checked off, and it's like, whoa, okay. <laughs> um, so we got time techniques to clean up the past. Um, Now the nice thing is it's it's um, we we didn't get heavily heavily into anchors, um, but you can actually do a lot with those with a little practice. Um, had a gal come in recently to quit smoking, so um, what I wanted to do was interrupt her habit. So so what I did was after talking to her and seeing. Kind of what it looked like when she would reach for a cigarette and whatnot. Um, I I anchored burning her hand on a hot stove, reaching for a hot and reaching for a stove, reaching out and then getting burned, getting burned, getting burned. And we anchored that a couple of times. And then I had her imagine reaching out for a cigarette and getting burned, feeling the heat. So when we fired off the anchor, she would reach for a cigarette and then pull her hand back, fe literally feeling the heat. So that was good, that was good. Um, then we anchored um, that if she was to bring a cigarette to her lips, um, 
that she would, well, what I anchored was burning rubber, burning rubber, burning her lips, burning rubber on her lips and dripping down her throat. So just imagine what that would feel like. That's nasty. Ugh. Okay? Like old, tired, burning, dripping, burning, dripping rubber on your lips and dripping down your throat. <clears throat> so we anchored that, we spent some time anchoring that, and then we anchored that to putting a cigarette to her lips. Um, did anybody see what I did wrong there, by the way? You see what I did wrong? Well, I, I, I did the anchor to picking up, touching a cigarette before I did the cigarette to the lips. I should really should have done it the other way around. Does it make any difference? I don't actually know. Does she have good results? <laughs> I haven't called her, I haven't called her in a little while, but I, I want to, I, I'm, I'm going to check on it. Um, I'll find out here. Um, but yeah, I think I would have done it the other way, is to you know, take the last step, anchor that first, and then anchor the, the, the first step and anchor that last. Um, but it seemed really powerful. It seemed like a good, a good hit. Um, and we did a lot of future pacing. We did a lot of... Um, uh, um, See, we didn't do too much. Her biggest thing was stress. That was the big emotion connected with smoking. Um, didn't seem to be a lot of, of old trauma. It was mostly recent around being like, being in an accident, being unemployed, um, kind of having this mixed, this weird mixed guilt feeling of, you know, kind of like guilt and embarrassment of being you know, being unemployed, um, so um, we worked on that for a while. Um, I guess there wasn't as much to say about this as I thought. <laughs> I just thought it would be an interesting conversation. Um, if anybody's thinking about working with adults and, and working possibly with addiction, um, that really, you know, that, that thought process, that ADD thought process, feeling victimized by your own brain. I mean, think about it. Of all the things you should be able to control, right? Of all the things that you should be, that should be in your absolute control. What you think. What you think. It's yours. So, so it's part of the stress reduction is like reframing the stuff that they're stressed about. I know you can um, release negative emotions on the past trauma, but um, also reframing the thing, like they're, they're fo so focused on pants on it, say like with Michelle, um, when she helped to see that maybe the day, you know, you use the universe, but a lot of people would use God, that God planned out your life and God's taking care of you. Mm -hmm. So if you reframe that day that, well, God was in control and whatever happened on that day, it was okay because God let it happen. It's like a reframe that maybe that day was what it was supposed to be and it's just your personal judgment about it that makes it stressful for you. So. Yes. Did everybody get that one? I, I, I don't, I'm not sure who was in the room at that point. Was everybody here? You weren't here. Okay. When I, when I, yeah, when we worked together on, on this, this, um, like th what was considered a bad day, um, we went through kind of like a fast, like a, kind of like a fast phobia thing. Um, and it really didn't have much effect. And that happens. That happens. You do one technique and, you know, didn't really change it from, for that person. Um, so... We, I dug a little deeper, and like like um, uh, uh, Kathy said, I just put out a, the, a kind of a presupposition, a, con a consideration that instead of your idea of the universe being what should be, is it the universe that 
is what should be, or it is what it is, and what it should be is irrelevant. It is what it, what it, is. it, it is. It is what it is. It doesn't matter what we want or don't want or think or don't think about it. That's all made up. That's all fantasy. What is, is. Good point. Good point. But that was a reframe. That was a classic reframe. Well, see, another thing that you do. Kind you of stand like in a different perspective. You stand somewhere else. You bring them over and, and you say, well, look at it from here. What does it look like for you? And a lot of times, that's enough. It just changes, it blows out the old emotions it, just by standing in a different place. Well, see, another thing you do a lot that, that you haven't really explained because you do it so unconsciously, we're just, we're just watching you do it, is complex equivalence. Like you're saying with the kids, they have this, this, and the school and the parents say, okay, this means that you're not smart, or this means blah. But what if it really means you're smarter? What if it really means you're artistic? What if it means something else? So mm -hmm. you take that and you give it a better meaning. Because um, you do that and you're not really telling us what you're doing. That's true. <laughs> you want to so true. if you could talk about the meaning, the complex equivalent aspect of what you do, that I think that would help. You know, the, you know taking the preconceived meaning of something and, and putting a different meaning on it gives you a whole different way of looking at it. Yeah, you know what I mean? but the way you're explaining that, it sounds like reframing. So I'm not sure I understand what you mean. Well, you, you could say this, this happened. I had a, a horrible day, and you could make all kind of meanings. Okay, that means, okay, that could mean I'm not very smart. That could mean I didn't listen to my mother. That could mean the people around me are idiots. Um, right. I mean, you could take anything that happened and put your own meaning on it. But right. that isn't necessarily true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, it's this event happens, so this this means this. And it's something it. that helped me in my recovery, and something that you did with me. Yes. This happened, but that doesn't necessarily mean what you think it does. You know? Um, yeah, like yeah, you're your right. If your mom I, treats you like I dirt. Do, I do that. Yeah, you yes. do it unconsciously. I know, I do that. But that means so. she hated me, but... It could mean that that's what she was doing the best she could. To her, maybe that was love. You know? Yeah, it's that, was, that was all she had to give you, or, or that yeah, was so, her way of expressing her love. Yeah. So it's like saying, this means, some people get stuck when they something happens and they say, oh, that means that. But really, if you give them a different meaning, then it, oh. Because we do that automatically. <laughs> we do that. Something happens and we make it mean something. We, we, that's what you and I did with, with Jalen, feeling, feeling like disrespected, right? So the, the, the unconscious equivalent, the, the, the complex equivalent is he mouths off to me or doesn't do what I want, therefore um, he doesn't respect me or I'm a bad mom or I, I'm something, you know, you make it mean something when if you strip away all that and you just look at this little guy who's sitting here and he's he's trying to find his way in the world and figure out how he can survive and and take care of himself and have some fun and and you know what I mean and and you and you take the behaviors and you you take the behaviors and you put them over here and you look no. at his intention and then what happened you and he had the same intention. So how can you look at him and be like, how can you get angry at that? If there's this poor little guy who's like trying to be understood and, and, and you know, it's like, boom, where, did, where does it go? It just, it's like, yeah, yeah very good, very good. Well, that's one thing that used to get me because I, my two boys acted out and I'd get the feeling the teacher in the same way, well, what kind of mother are you, you know? <laughs> yeah, a lot of parents are dealing with that. Yeah, what's, what's wrong with... I, I read that all the time on Facebook. Yeah, what's wrong with me? And, and they, you know, oh, you know, we're losing our friends and people look at me strange and, you know, in the grocery store and blah, blah, blah. So, so they're making that, a whole meaning out of yeah, my kids be a got bad ADD. Mother because, because just because he's artistic and thinks differently, you know, you could change 
mindset is, you know what, I probably have some gifted genes that that child has. Mm. <laughs> so maybe it's a good thing I'm his mother. <laughs> we just need to learn how to develop it. So, like, so <laughs> basically my website, I mean, it's like the whole thing is built around gifted, not broken. So as yeah, soon as somebody, as yeah. soon as somebody goes to my website, they're already starting to get reframed. They're already starting to get reframed. And it's going to filter out all the ones that are committed to, you know, the, the story. So they're probably not going to come see me unless they totally don't pay attention to the website at all. Um, but they're probably going to get filtered out because gifted, not broken, it goes against the story. Um, knowing that you can take action and you can empower yourself and, and empower your kids... It, it violates that story of being a victim, you know, of, I'm helpless, I'm, it's not my fault, right? And if, if they're not willing to go there, again, they're going to look at the website and say, I don't like this guy, you know, give me my meds or give me my excuse or whatever it is, and I'll just stay over here. But if they're willing to say, hmm, what can I do with this? And they're going to let go of some of that nonsense guilt and, and that. And they're going to say, boy, you know, I'd rather be empowered than right. I would rather find a solution than be justified. So that's in the, in the addiction part, too. Part of the thing is some of those people have been told they're not smart or they have learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. and Probably so a lot with of them, yeah. the brain trained brain, they run that through. So even part of recovery from addiction is telling them they're not broken, they're gifted. Mm -hmm. And that helps them quit being so down on themselves. Yeah. Because don't you think one of the things that puts people back in addiction is they have a bad day and they start thinking, well, I can never do better and I can never do that and what they said was right and it go, kind of goes down the negative route all. Well, yeah, and if they, if they are over here, there's a really good chance they struggled in school they weren't as successful. They didn't quite fit in. You know, you, I mean, even at an early age, most kids, they, we can smell we're different. We don't know why. We can't explain it. But we already know that they, you know, little Betty Sue, she does not think like I do. Okay? You know, in her little, eh, hi, Mrs. Johnson. <laughs> can I erase the board? You know. Hey, it's just, there's just, like, we're in different worlds. Um, the other thing um, that I wanted to just touch on, and we might as well do it tonight, since we're, we're I think we're going to end it probably by 6.30, if not before. Um, what is, we, I started to say this, what is thinking? What is it to think? And what's the purpose of thinking? So... I want to make the case that whether by God or by nature, we are designed for survival, right? That's why there's 9 billion people on the planet or something, right? So, so we are designed for survival. We, we want to protect ourselves is a nat, you know, very natural instinct. We want to eat. If we're hungry, we will eat. So we fuel the body. We drink. Um, we, you know, we want to have babies, right? Really strong instinct there. Um, and so, so you can see that a lot of our behaviors are, are basically and built, our motivators are built around survival. How do we survive as individuals? How do we survive as a species? And I think I talked a little bit about the, the like, you know, the Republican and Democrat, right? Oops. Or or the conservative versus liberal, the the um, kind of the every man for himself, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and let's all hug and take care of each other. And those two polarities are a part of who we are. They're in all of us. And they go we go back and forth. Um, and society goes back and forth. It kind of, we, you know, we, you see, we swing to the left, and then we swing to the right, and then we swing a little bit back to the left, 
and then we swing a little more to the right. Um, but it, it, but it keeps going. If you know, you watch the elections over a period of a hundred years, it keeps going back and forth, right? Um, so we've got these two instincts, with the point being survival. Now, the question is, survival of what? This is an important question, because some people do some pretty weird things, you know? Like, a mother might risk her life to go into a burning building to save her baby. Um, somebody might go into his house to save a painting or his jewels or his money or something else and risk his life, right? Um, so what the, the expression, the way, I think the way I would put that is survive, the mind is a structure for survival, survival of the being, right? Remember going back to man, being, Dyson? Survival of the being or whatever the being considers itself to be. So that is really, that can really be important when you're talking with a person. What is survival? Is it, is it my friend's approval? Right? Because a little kid, he doesn't know about taking care of his own needs and fighting and, and warring and, well, hopefully he doesn't know about procreation yet. Okay? So what are his, what's his survival? His survival is peer approval. His survival is looking good. His survival is um, not being wrong. Does that make sense? So when, you, when we sit down with a, a little guy um, and we're looking at how to motivate him and how to, to um, connect him with his goals or what's important to him, you know, it could be that, you know, looking good for his friends is, that's who he, who he believes himself to be. Or showing off for the girls, or, or um, just not being wrong. <laughs> I mean, that's a big part of survival. Most people, most, especially most adults, um, when they walk into a conversation, they are already always right. We are, as a, pe as, a, as a being. When, you know, when we walk into a conversation, we are already always right. Is it possible to take on a new understanding and a new belief? Absolutely, if we're open to it. But when you sit down with a client, whether it's the parent or whoever, they already have an idea of what's right and what's, what's wrong. And... And that's, that's, that's already there before you open your mouth. <laughs> um, most people need to justify their, their existence. They need to justify their action. They need to justify their behavior, their beliefs. Um, so if you don't give parents or children, for that matter, an out. If you if you don't give them an out, an excuse, well, it's understandable why you thought this way. See, I, I use that one a lot. You know, because the conventional wisdom is that you're broken. The conventional wisdom is your child's broken. The conventional wisdom is that um, there's nothing you can do for your child. So I acknowledge where they're at. I acknowledge, I, I, I give them an out so I don't have to make them wrong. They can say, yes, that's right. Yeah, they told me he was broken. They told me he couldn't succeed. They told me. Does that make sense? Um, very, very powerful to give somebody an out. And, and that, it's weird. It's really weird because it's like it, it completes the belief and allows them to let it go then. <laughs> Once you tell them it's okay to have the belief, they're in a much better position to let it go. 